Well, I want to welcome everyone to the Thursday Night Dove of Life Bible Study. We're in our fourth lesson on grace. And uh, the name of the lesson is Many Forms. Grace takes on many forms. Um, so let's turn to 1 Peter, <clears throat> First Peter 4.10. And while you're turning there, I will open up in prayer. <clears throat> Father, once again, we thank you for allowing us the privilege of coming before your throne. We want to hear from you. We want to be able to become more like you. And the only way we can do that is through the word and the leading of your spirit. And we ask for both tonight. Both the word comes forth from your spirit and his leading. Lord, we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise, for without you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. Uh, here's what 1 Peter 4.10 says. As each one has received the gift, minister it to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So here's my first note. Every good thing that comes from God is part of the gift of grace. That's first. Two, the word manifold means, the dictionary meanings, have many forms or parts, many sorts, a pipe with several outlets for exhaust from an engine. That's where they call it a manifold in the car. It's, a, it's where the exhaust can come out from different pipes. Well, the, same, the manifold grace of God comes out from the Holy Spirit in many, many different ways, and they call it manifold grace, okay? Um, we are to minister, according to 1 Peter 4.10, we are to minister our part of the gift to others as they are to minister their part of the gift to us. So what it's saying is the body of Christ through grace, gets different gifts. And those gifts we're supposed to share with one another as, as best we can when, when the body of Christ <clears throat> gets together. Okay? We are all given different gifts and different forms of the gift of grace. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, uh, many, many different forms of the grace of God that come from that one grace. It comes in many, many different forms. It is the Holy Spirit who works all these things, distributing to each individual as he wills. And if you want to read that into if further, you can read it into first, in 1 first Corinthians chapter 12. Um, You'll find even more stuff on that, okay? Uh, turn with me to Galatians 1.15. Galatians 1.15. Now that we know that there's a manifold grace, many, many parts of that grace that come on the body of Christ, we can go deeper, a little further today. Galatians 1.15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and, and called me by his grace. And here's my note. After we were born from woman, which is what I was talking about, we are then, as scripture tells us, born again in the spirit. The grace of God separates us, as it says, from the spirit, from the world, and then calls us. Okay. The grace that we're talking about are the manifold gifts tonight uh, uh, from the Holy Spirit. Those gifts do not come on the world. And they didn't come on us until we got into the body of Christ, until we were washed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. So we have this distinction as Christians to be able to receive many, many different aspects of the grace of God in the form of gifts, now, we're doing gifts right now, but we also know that it comes in the form of justification and righteousness and um, uh, salvation and the, the blood of Christ and so many different ways that we spoke about in the last three 
lessons. But tonight, it seems here we're gearing a little bit right now on the gifts. And uh, it's another aspect of God's grace. So we shouldn't take those gifts for granted. And we sh it says, if you when you read that chapter, it says, desire these graces. Uh, they will help us. Uh, the more grace, the more of these gifts we have, well, right off the bat, the word of wisdom, the more wisdom we have, knowledge, the more knowledge we have, the more faith we have, the more ab ability we have to heal, even ourselves. We lay hands on ourselves in this house to heal ourselves, and we lay hands on each other. Laid hands on Valerie, and she's going to get healed, and she's going to be all right. The gift of miracles. To be actually, it's a gift to be able to work miracles, to prophesy, okay? Discerning of spirits. Remember, we talked about in spiritual warfare, how we need to discern the, the spirits, okay? The gift of tongues that helps us to pray when we don't know how to pray anymore. And then the interpretation of tongues. Do you know I've had where God gives me tongues, and then he actually, through me, interprets the tongues that he gives me? just to let me know that that's possible. So these are wonderful, wonderful gifts. They're not just something that we wrote in the book. And they really, really will encourage us and help our lives and move us along. And we need to get along with God, quiet time, and say, Father, I want as many of these gifts, these manifold gifts, I want them in my life and the life of my family. Okay. Uh, that's a way to pray for a person. Father, put your manifold gifts of grace upon my son, upon my daughter, upon my loved one, upon this, your manifold uh, uh, gifts from grace on my children and on my family. It's another way to pray, especially when we have it and we know what it is, and then we can give it to others. And it separates us, and that's what was, he's talking about. After we come out of the womb, we are separated from the world, okay? Um, to give, and he pours out these gifts into the body of Christ. So the world has no clue what we're talking about. The Lord can, uh, the, the world cannot receive these gifts, okay? We, did, we couldn't receive them before we were saved. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor that God gives his children that from the spiritual realm comes these beautiful gifts and um, the, the Holy Spirit distributes to them as he will, but it says we need to desire them. He doesn't want to give us something we really don't want. When we desire them, when we understand them and we say, wow, Father, you know, I really like those gifts. I, would, I, I ask for all of them. And then he gives me what he wants to give, okay? My second note is, after he calls you, he does not, not leave you to your own devices. He gives you his strength. That's what these gifts are. Their strength. Okay. In this case, the, the gift of grace manifests as a calling for Paul as a minister. First, he separated Paul, and then he called him. That's what Paul's talking about. He said, I've been separated from the world, and even separated from the body of Christ to do a specific thing. And you remember we talk, talked about the overall burden for souls, and then we talked about the specific burden for souls. And this is where this comes in. That specific burden for souls, we need those gifts in order to uh, manifest that gift, in order to use that specific burden. And this is what Paul is saying. If I stayed in the body of Christ, as far as just getting involved in every little thing, you know, in everybody's business and getting involved in everything the church is doing and everything, he said, God could never use me. Uh, in, in another part of, of the Bible, in the, Old, in the New Testament, it says God called Paul out to go to a certain place. So he's, first he separates us from our mother's womb, then he separates us from the world, by giving us his grace in, in the born-again experience. And then after we're born again, he begins to separate us from other people to give us that gift and to give us these gifts so that we could take it back to those people. You may get the gift of discernment. I may get the gift of wisdom. 
your discernment and my wisdom, we help each other. You see, God is, is not far from, and my teaching is not far from the body of Christ must love one another, be with one another, activate with one another, talk to one another. Okay, this is God's desire. And sometimes he puts us in strange places. Right now we're on Zoom. Some of us, I know, you go to church on Sunday. So whether you're on church, whether it's church or Zoom or, or just in the neighborhood where you meet Christians or you go to a, a restaurant and you meet somebody that's a Christian and you want to talk to them, you, can, you have the gifts to be able to share uh, the power of the Lord. That's what these gifts are. They're the power, the wisdom, the discernment. Okay. Uh, and Paul is reminding us, hey, I was called out and given the gift of, to teaching and given the gift of, of apostleship. Uh, you, you're called out too. So ask for those gifts and you'll receive them. Okay, the next thing it says, the gift is actually an ornament. It's almost a gift, uh, like you would give your bride a gift or you give your husband a gift, a nice piece of jewelry. Let's read, let's go to Proverbs, the first chapter. And the eighth and the ninth verse. Proverbs 1, 8, and 9. Okay. 1 and 9. Here we go. My son, daughter. You, you understand when the Bible speaks of son, the speaking of sons and daughters, that's just a generic term that the Bible uses. Instead of keep saying sons and daughters, sons and daughters, they just use it as a generic term. Sons, okay. My son, daughter, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace upon thy head and chains about thy neck. My son, don't consent, don't consent if sinners entice you. He's going, he gives us a necklace of grace to be adorned. Now, we can't see that necklace, but we can see it when we look at it through the spiritual eyes of the grace that we have. That grace hangs around us like a necklace. And God is saying people can see that necklace. Not in the, not in the sense of, oh, I, I see a necklace, but what, why are you different? What do you have that I don't have? You have a joy that I don't have. You have a wisdom that I don't have. You have a peace that I don't have. That's the necklace of grace, that wisdom, that discernment, uh, that prophecy, the discerning of spirits. I counsel with it, and, and it's a necklace that God says we have around us. Here's my first note. When children adhere to the instruction of their father and do what their mother tells them, and are not enticed by sinners, then they advice takes a form of grace, undeserved favor. This is in the natural too. When especially Christian children, when they listen to their parents, those children are given a necklace, a, a, a necklace of grace, undeserved favors, what is it is, likened to an ornament of great price placed around our neck. Likewise, when we as God's children obey the word of the Lord, the word, the advice in it, then becomes a beautiful chain of favor, grace, so great that it can be seen by others in the natural world. When we read the word of God, God says, when you adhere to my word, that's where his commands are. When you adhere to my word, when you adhere to my spirit, God places a necklace, a beautiful necklace, a spiritual necklace around our necks so that we can look different and dressed up in front of people, okay? The purpose of this ornament and a favor around our neck is for all to understand that there is a God and that he loves and blesses those who diligently follow him. So the first thing is the body of Christ knows they have this necklace around their neck and if you didn't before you know now and that necklace helps us 
because we understand, oh, that other person has that necklace too. And they're using that gift of discernment. They're using that gift of wisdom. They're using that gift of teaching. And we see in other people, sometimes we, we call it the glory of God, but we see the Holy Spirit manifesting. But what we're actually seeing is the gifts of God coming through. As, as someone sees a necklace, other Christians see us and they see those gifts. And the more we activate them, the more we use them, the, the more we, we uh, love them and cherish them, the more you'll do it in earnest and the more people will, and Christians will relate to one another through that gift, through those gifts, okay? It is not only for us to enjoy, but it is to tie others to come to him. Many times you can show gifts that other Christians don't have. And other Christians say, you know what? I want that gift too. And it entices other Christians to go before God and say, you know, they have that. Why can't I have that? Well, we can. And of course, it, other, it entices through curiosity the world who don't have any of it. Okay. So we have a chain around our neck. Let's go to Proverbs 4. You're right there in Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs 4. 7 and 10. And I'll tell you, some of my joy in the Lord and my ability to stay close to the Lord, and I'm sure many of you have this same ability, is through my knowledge of what God has given me through this grace. The, the, what I said before, the salvation and the righteousness and the justification, but also the gifts that he has given us. And I entertain those gifts and I enjoy those gifts and I use it even for my advantage. Okay. Uh, verse 4, 7, 10. Here's another gift. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her wisdom and she will promote you. There is a promotion in God. The more wisdom we get, the more God raises us up. The more God makes us like him, the more we can affect other people. Okay. It actually promotes you. That's what it's saying. She, wisdom, will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place you at your, the, on your head. Here it is. An ornament of grace, a crown of glory. She will deliver to you. This is in the natural. Now, there is going to be a, a natural crown that we can see in heaven when we get there. But right now, in the spiritual realm, God places a crown of glory on us when we walk in close to him. And people can see him in us, and they can look and they say, yeah, you know, that person walks so close to the Lord, I can almost see that crown that's on his or her head. Okay. Hear my son. And receive my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. Whoa. So we talked that about that last week. Well, God knows when we, we're going to die. Yeah, but that God doesn't make cause it all the time. What God is saying is, I, I have a time for you to die, and it may not be young. But if you want to go out and drive 100 miles an hour to a brick wall, that's your business. But if you adhere to my words... If you let that balanced life that we talked about, if you let the Holy Spirit manifest in that balanced life through the wisdom that you're getting through the word of God, okay, that balanced life will then be so great, it will give you long life. But I believe when he's saying long life, just not length of days. Length of days where you're serving him, walking with him, enjoying yourself. He's not talking about you getting cancer 50 years old and you're going to have cancer for the next 40 years and suffer. I don't think that's what the word is talking about. It's talking long life with all the blessings, all the gifts, all the manifestations of God's grace. That comes from knowing the word. So the more you know the word, the more you're helping yourself. The, the, the more you shun the word or don't read the word, um, you're limiting your abilities to affect it, an effective life through the Holy Spirit. Okay? Here's my first note. Wisdom 
true wisdom. We're not talking about going on Google. We're not talking about an encyclopedia, okay? We're not talking about college. That's wisdom of a different kind. <laughs> We're talking of true wisdom, which comes from God's word and his spirit. That's what we're talking about, which leads to understanding. Understanding what? Two and two is four? No. Understanding the ways of God. I'm not saying there's not truth in, in what you're learning in college and on Zoom and on Google. I'm not saying not. But we're talking about truth that comes from God and how that truth can affect our life, how we can be productive in life for our families, for God. That's the wisdom of God. When we embrace this wisdom, it will bring us honor. God will put you and raise you up to a position of honor in your family, with your friends, with other Christians, in your ministries, whatever the case may be. Wisdom will place an ornament of grace. What's grace favor? An ornament of favor, not that you deserved it, but an ornament of favor upon you just for getting that wisdom. This time in the form of a crown on our head. In other words, God's truth is so great, it's like a crown of glory in the natural world. Just like you would be crowned queen or king in the natural and get a crown, that's what God's doing to us. I, you are my children, and I am crowning you with crowns of glory and necklaces of grace so that you can look and understand that you are beautiful in his sight. That's how I look at myself, folks. I don't look at myself as handsome in the natural. I look at myself as beautiful in his sight. Because what happens when we get older than this and we look even worse than I look now, okay? I still gonna look beautiful in God's sight that's what he said so i can be a hundred years old decrepit you know no hair everything fell to the ground and yet god says i see the crown on your head and the necklace around your neck and you are beautiful in my sight don't forget that In other words, God's truth is so great that it's like a crown of glory in the natural world. And all to see, uh, uh, for all to see, as an added benefit, your years will be many. Note number two, the purpose of the crown of glory is not only for us to enjoy, which I was just talking about, but once again, just like the necklace, it is also to see, to entice others to become like God. You can be a, you don't have to be old. We, we happen to be some of us a little bit senior citizens. But I'm talking, this message could easily go to young people. You can be 18. My grandson's 15 years old. He gets in that word at 15 years old. The next thing you know, he has a crown on his head. He has a necklace draped around him. God thinks he's beautiful, and God will make him shine to our brothers and sisters in Christ, even make us shine to the world who's interested. Now, some, some of it will bring persecution from the world. Oh, we have to, I have to preach that too, okay? But that shining will be there in God's sight. And, and it can go from a 15-year-old in glory to a 20-year-old in glory to a 30-year-old to a 40-year-old and on and on and on and on. So this could be even taught to your grandchildren. Show them the Bible. God has a crown of glory for you and a necklace and favor and all of these gifts waiting for you. I wish somebody would have told me that when I was 15 years old, don't you? Okay. All right. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 10. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 10. And of course, I'm always doing everything in the new King James. And I let you know when I divert from the King James to another, to another Bible. Another. Okay, 1, Cor 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. Here we go. 
but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. So we're still on wisdom here. We, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages of glory. Here we go again. Not only was grace ordained before the foundations of the world, not only was favor, uh, mercy uh, ordained before the foundations of the world, but he's also saying that wisdom was ordained for us to have from the foundations of the world before the ages of our, before our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's why I'm saying to you, the world cannot receive these gifts. The enemy cannot receive these gifts. If Satan understood these gifts, and had the wisdom and discernment that the Lord had, he would have never crucified Christ because he would have known better because that saved everyone in the body of Christ up to this time and millions more to still come. And that's what it's saying. He would, they would not have crucified the, the, the Lord of, of glory if they had our wisdom. Verse 9, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor had entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. You can't even imagine. That's down here on earth, too. You can't even imagine what God has prepared for you every time you continue to love him. It just gets better and better and better. Okay? But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. And there it is, the spirit of truth, the spirit of wisdom. Com wisdom comes by reading the word and the spirit of God. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Now, here's my note, and it starts with unfortunately. Unfortunately, man without a desire for God turns away from wisdom that comes in the form of a free gift from heaven. They cannot receive what the Spirit of God reveals to us who believe. They can't, they can't receive it. Therefore, there will be no crown of glory here on earth or in eternity for them unless they accept Jesus Christ. If they die without accepting Jesus Christ, there was no crown of glory, there was no wisdom, there was no discernment, there was no necklace here on earth, and there won't be any in the afterlife. Okay. My next caption is, Grace Till the Rapture. <laughs> Uh, let's go to 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, 13a. Now, 1 Peter is all the way at the end of the book. Back up from Revelation, there's Jude, there's 2 Peter, and then there's 1 Peter. Uh, is John in the way there? Yeah, there's John, the two Johns come, and then Peter, Okay. 1 Peter 1, 13. And we, I'm going to break this one verse into three parts. Okay, Let's do part A. Wherefore, gird upon your loins of your mind. Okay, The Expositor Study Bible says this, in view of what the Lord has done for us. What a wonderful way to put it. Okay, Wherefore, gird your loins of your mind. Always remember the goodness that God has done for us. And I've mentioned this several times, that I even go back in my life and, and, and relive all the blessings that God does for me. And I say thank you. And that's what we all should do all the time. Okay? And that's what it's saying there. Guard your mind with that. Okay. Part B, be sober. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you. Hope to the end, the rapture, hope to the end, the grace that is to be brought to you. Talking here about the glorification of the saints, our glorified bodies. Hope to the end for that. That's what we should be hoping for. I don't know what you folks are hoping for in the natural, but I, I know my hope as closer I, elder I get and the grayer this hair gets, closer I get to heaven, my hope is for that glorified body. My hope is to be with God, to be with my saved family in heaven. That's my hope. 
Sal, you mean with all that's going around, you know, socially, politically, everything, you can you can smile and you can be joyful. Yes, I can, because my joy, my strength, my faith is not building on what goes on in this country or in the world. It's in Christ Jesus. The only reason I watch television is so I know how to pray. That's the only reason I watch it. My mind is focused on God. It's focused on his word. Because it is, let me tell you something, and I'm getting closer and closer to that day. When that day comes, the television is not going to help you. Your friends are not going to help you. Sometimes even family can't help you. Okay? There's only one person that you're going to call upon. Hopefully you'll be able to. Jesus, Holy Spirit, I need you right now. Okay? Help me over this bridge that I'm crossing. Okay. All right. So uh, we want to make sure that bridge is strong now, that, that the world doesn't interfere with that bridge, and that we remain strong in the Lord and joyful in him for that day. And it doesn't have, you know, tomorrow I could have a heart attack. It could happen. And, 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 and I could be minutes away from dying. And I'll just say, Jesus, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Because the joy of the Lord is truly my strength. Okay. All right. Uh, well, that wasn't even in my notes. You got that for free. Okay. But as it is, uh, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor entered into the heart of... Am I reading the right thing? Where am I? Are you... Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We did that already, right? Okay. We're first, Peter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Got carried away myself. First, Peter. This is plus C. Mm -hmm. At the revelation of Jesus Christ. And once again, the expositor Bible says, referring to the revelation of Christ, the rapture of the church. Because that's what revelation means, reveal. Okay. So let's read the whole thing. Wherefore, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the re revelation of Christ Jesus. Wonderful verse. Let's go to 1 John 3 2. Uh, that's uh, a couple of books towards the end. Both a couple of books. 1 John, not the Gospel of John, 1 John. Three, two. This just goes to what I just read. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed, there's the revealing, what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What a promise. That's where our hope should be. That's where our joy should be. Not only that, from reading the Bible, we know that everything is in the palm of God's hands. We as children of the Lord are in the palm of God's hands. Read the Old Testament, how the nations are in the... the, the Israel was in the palm of God's hands, and the nations were in the, the presence, the power of God. Nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing that happens in this world takes God by surprise. Okay. Oh, look what just happened. I don't know what I should do. Now, God's not surprised by anything. And he has wisdom and power over everything. And we need to rest. Rest in, in that. Okay. Uh, I, never, I never forget. I read the, the, uh, the, the book by, uh, it was the Holocaust. It was on the Holocaust. I forgot the name of the book, but it was talking about Corey Temple, who was placed in a concentration camp as a Christian. You know, we we have problem when uh, we have trouble with our washing machine, but you know, we think it's the end of the world. But we as Christians, and it's happening all over the world, we can be thrown in prison, and we can be our life can be in jeopardy. And, and the only reason right now we're not in this country is because we've been praying. 
But the minute the church stops praying for that, watch out, okay? What are you going to do when you're in prison? Is the joy of the Lord going to leave you? You know what Corrie Tamboom did? She preached Christ to the people who were in the concentration camps, bringing salvation to them. Could you imagine looking back that you're in heaven now and you say, I was in a concentration camp, ready to die, ready to go to hell, and here I am now in heaven, in glory, sitting with Christ Jesus, and I'm waiting for my glorified body. A lot of those prisoners in those concentration camps made that leap through, through Corey Temple and other people like that, and, and even around the world today who keep preaching the gospel, no matter what happens. Okay. All right. Um, let me read it to you, that same verse. Let me read it to you in the Amplified. Beloved, we are, even here and even here and now, children of God, and it is not made clear what we will be after his coming. We know that when he comes and is revealed, we will, as his children, be like him, because we will see him just as he is in all his glory. So he's not, this is not talking about coming to earth after the rapture, because people aren't going to see his, aren't, aren't going to manifest that looking like him uh, in the, after the tribulation period. Okay, they, they're still going to be human beings. And yes, they're going to go from year to year to worship the king and on his throne, and but they're still going to have to read their word and, and fellowship and get closer to God to become even more like him even a little bit. I'm talking now after the tribulation period in the millennial. So that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the, the Christians who in that twinkling of an eye, our bodies are changed, and we meet God in the air, and we see him like he is, we will be like him, okay, in our glorified bodies. Okay. Here's my note. The word, gird your mind and be sober, all speak of clear mind where faith is concerned. We can have all these free gifts from here unto eternity by just keeping faith alive in us. Doing whatever we need to do to keep faith strong. Read, pray, worship, commune, keep, keep the four legs down, the priesthood, the bride, the heir, the, uh, uh, what I leave out, the child, all four legs down. Remember we talked about that? We don't have to do anything to receive these free gifts, but we must maintain faith. That's all God asks us to do. Do whatever you can to maintain faith. And these gifts will just come to you as I want to give them to you, you know. And the more you ask for them, maybe he'll, they, you'll find favor and he'll give you even more gifts. Just stay firm in faith. We don't have to do anything to receive these gifts, but we must maintain faith, which does not require work in him who gives them to us. Okay, now, the next section, it says how to act responsibly. Let's go to Romans 6.1. Romans 6, 1. After all the Gospels, you have the book of Acts, of course, and then we have the book of Romans. Verse, chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You remember, I, I think it was a week ago or two weeks ago, I talked about grace abounding, that no matter how many people are on this earth, grace will cover it. No matter how much, any, how many times those people sin, grace will cover it when they come to Christ. Okay? The more there is sin, the more grace abounds. So what Paul is saying, what, what then? Shall we say, oh, let us go out and sin so grace does that much more about. And, you know, he wouldn't have put that in there if he didn't know people. Because <laughs> if that wasn't in the Bible, you better believe there were a cult in Christianity would come up and say, no, you don't understand. 
God is saying we can sin all we want to sin because grace will cover it. And God and Paul is saying, no, let's let's go to the 15th verse. You're in chapter 6, let's go to the 15th verse. In the same vein, he's continuing. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Okay. Hold your place in Romans, because we're going to go after this to Ephesians. Hold your place in the New Testament. Go with me to Leviticus chapter 11. Now, Leviticus is uh, in the Torah, the first five books of Moses. There's uh, Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. Leviticus, the 11th chapter, and the 44th verse. Eleven forty four. Here we go. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourself. Would we say the word consecration means set apart? God has set you apart from the world. You need to continue to set yourself apart. Okay, not to go back to the world to act like you were doing before we were saved, just because you're saved by grace. That's not consecration. Okay. And you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourself with creeping things that creep on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Israel, Israel to be your God. And you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. How did they stay holy? By following the law, and when they couldn't, they repented. Yom Kippur, the blood was covered their sins from year to year until Jesus came. Okay? That's how you stay holy. You continue to ask God for forgiveness for the sins of the day and keep applying the blood of Jesus Christ and asking God to help you, to ask God for, not for forgiveness, but uh, confess your sins and then God said he will forgive you your sins and keep you in that holy position. Okay. Um, let me just, in the same vein, you don't have to turn there. Let me go to 1 Peter 1, 16. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. I just threw that in just in case you thought that was just Old Testament. Okay. 1 Peter 1, 16 says, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Okay. Now, let's go to Ephesians Chapter 4, verse 29. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 29. And now he gives you some examples and some ways to, uh, to continue in that holiness. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. I would say that that would be cursing, backbiting, gossiping, slandering, okay, uh, by which, but that which is good to be used of edify, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's go from the beginning. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth by that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may manifest gifts unto the hearer. Change your communication, it's what it's saying, okay? If you know the way you communicate to people, the way you act, but by the way, when you're gossiping to someone about someone else, guess what that person is thinking? This person is going to gossip against me also. Gossip is deadly, and it's deadly to your reputation, okay? So be careful. Okay, whatever you, whatever somebody sees you do to someone else, they're going to believe you're going to do it to them eventually. All right. So, so what we want to do is we want to get all that away from us, all those cursings. Uh, and uh, where did I find some of that? First Peter 2 1. First Peter 2 1. It says, put down all guile, hypocrisy, malice, envy, and evil speaking 
like born, but like newborn children, take up the milk of the word so that you may grow by it. What's the milk of the word? Jesus died for us. Jesus rose again. Jesus is coming back. Keep yourself in the Lord and the goodness of the Lord and the word of God so that we as children of God can act righteous and it will flow from us. A couple of weeks, we're going to start talking about tongues. <laughs> okay. But right now, I'm just giving you a little bit of preview. Minister the word of God through grace. Okay. <clears throat> Here's my, my note. What I just said, grace lifts people up, not tears them down. If we find ourselves from time to time putting down, putting people down, then we are acting like the world. Grace, uh, but not like a child of God. We're acting like the world, but not like a child of God. Okay. Let's go to Colossians 3.16. Colossians 3.16. And going back to that, Ephesians 4.29 for a second. Uh, I, I just m missed that, and I don't want to miss it. It says that it may minister grace to the hearers. The word that comes out of your mouth is gifts to people. God gives gifts to other people through you. And that gift could even go to the world. When you start preaching the gospel, when you're kind, when you're when you are telling people how much you care for them, even if they're not saved, and especially if they're not saved, you are ministering that grace that, that, that God wants you to have, and, and it ministers to them, okay? I don't, I don't want you to misunderstand that point. That's grace I was talking about there. Okay, Galatians 3.16. Let the word of Christ, Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, this is ultimate Christianity. This is what God is saying through the Holy Spirit, through Paul. This is how I would like the church to be. From my understanding of 40 years working with Christians, we have a long way to go. But that doesn't mean you have to have a long way to go. It doesn't mean you can't take this as ammunition for yourself and say, you know what? Even if other people don't do it, that means what? I shouldn't do it? No. Let, let's, let's read that again, okay? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, in singing with grace in your heart towards the Lord. Okay? And it's hard for me to express that here on Zoom, but I believe the people up in Pennsylvania, uh, we sang, we, we had hymns, we talked, we did psalms, we talked to one another around a table, we ate. For an hour, we communicated the love of the Lord towards one another. Um, as pastor of, of churches, I was able to go in and, you know, I used to go up and down the rows before church started. How are you? How are you? Ministering to them. By the way, I have a word for you. Oh, God said this. You know, God said that. And just pouring love upon people. That's, that's the understanding that God has that is what the church should be doing. <laughs> Not arguing with ourselves, we should be pouring love upon one another, and that love should flow to other people, okay? Now, you say, Pastor, uh, if that's the ultimate, I'm, I'm 16 rungs past zero, <laughs> down. Okay, so go from 16 rungs down to 13 rungs down, and work your way to zero, and then start working your way up, one, two, three, four, five, okay? That's what repentance is. When you find out a truth, when you say, you know what? Yeah, that's what I should be doing. Okay, God, Sal told me what I should be doing. I need your help to begin to do that. Okay, let's go to, and I say that all the time because I, I, 
I, I look at myself as still trying to get to zero, but I'm trying. Colossians 4, 6. Colossians 4, 6. That's the next book of, <clears throat> next chapter of Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech be always with grace. It's like unmerited faith. See, we, when, when we read these scriptures, we glance over this word grace, but now I'm teaching on it. And it's sort of, oh, you know, okay, that, that's the unmerited favor that God wants us to show to other people. You give them grace they don't deserve, even the unsaved, especially the unsaved. Grace they don't deserve. Love they don't deserve. Okay? Now, you don't condone their sin. That's not what I'm saying. But when you can, you don't shun unsaved people. You go to them with the grace of God, with a smile on your face. Okay? Good morning. How are you this morning? Okay. They think you're nuts, but that's okay. Seasoned with salt. Remember, if you lose your salt, you're no good. Okay? What is, what is that season with salt? You've got to stay close to the Holy Spirit. You have to have the joy of the Lord inside of you through him. Okay. That you may know how we ought to answer every man. You should get with God. You should read your Bible. You should practice it. In what situation do I use this? In what situation do I say that? How do I handle when this person comes to me with that situation? It should take us by surprise as Christians. Ask God, Father, help me to be ready when somebody talks to me. This is goes for leadership in the church, too. We're trying to lead people. God, make me ready for their questions even before they ask so that I don't, you know, say something wrong or harsh or something I shouldn't say or the way I should say it. It should always be we try to be with love and nurturing, bringing Christians closer to Christ, bringing the world closer to God if we can. Okay, this is, should be our goal. Uh, how do I do it? I, in my eyes, I stink in this, but I try. Okay, I try. And, and that's the key. See, repentance is not getting to, to nirvana. Repentance is not being perfect. That's through the blood. Okay, repentance means a constant turning all your life. You repented and you, you, you repented, you turned from the darkness to the light, to Christ, and now you're saved. But now that that initial turning has happened, now God says, keep turning in yourself, in your mind, in your understanding, in your emotions, and your will. Keep turning. What is turning? Repenting. A lot of people mean think re repenting means sorry, God. It's not what repenting means. Re repent means I'm sorry, and now I'm going to change. I'm going to start doing the things you want me to do, and I'm not. I'm going to. And I'm going to stop doing the things you don't want me to do. That's repentance. Not asking for forgiveness. That's repentance. Doing it. Okay. Okay. Let's go to two Timothy. 2-1. 2 Timothy 2-1. 2 Timothy, I think, is right after, uh, not too far. Yeah, if where, where you are in Colossians, you pass Thessalonians and you come to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. Okay, so look on the top of the book, make sure it's 2 Timothy. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. Where do you find that grace? In Christ. There is no place else. You find it in his word, and you find it through the spirit. So the more you press into Christ, the more you press into his word, the more grace comes upon you, okay? Okay the more strength you'll have in that grace for yourself and for other people. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. <laughs> Father, we just thank you tonight that you we, we do have the ability to come before you and receive that grace, the manifold gifts that your grace brings. 
the way to act in front of other people, Lord, the way not to act in front of other people, all through your grace, Lord. That crown on our heads, the, the, the necklace around our neck. Thank you, Lord, that you see us as a beautiful person, your child crowned with glory. And we give you all the honor and the praise and the glory for that. And Father, let us be able to draw from what we know, draw other people close to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.